Federal government's cash intervention and threats of protest over palliatives in Lagos. And inconclusive results, not election results this time, but results for COVID-19 tests. Missed messages coming from Aquabum State Government. This is PLOS Politics and I am Felicity Ezewike. Welcome to the program. It is day four of the lockdown initiated by President Muhammad Buhari in three states and already in Lagos State. Some residents have come out to threaten that if palliatives are not provided by the government during the period of the lockdown, they will take to the streets to protest. This is coming as the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management, Sadia Umar Farouk, stated that 2.6 million vulnerable persons will benefit from the federal government cash transfer intervention program. This is a country of over 200 million people and over 2 million internally displaced persons. Joining us to have a conversation on um, this is Reputation Manager Tubosu Akeju. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good evening. We'll be having um, via Skype a little later. Hopefully we'll be able to connect with him. Uh, that will be the Follow the Money CEO, Hamza Lawal. But before he joins us, let's start with you. 2.6 million vulnerable persons to benefit. They've started the process already. And we also know that less than 48 hours um, after the lockdown, residents in parts of Lagos are already protesting. Let's begin by your thoughts on all of this. Um, I, I think that it was um, a good move by the federal government to um, proceed with the plan to um, you know, give uh, relief funds to people who are, you know, extremely poor. Um, I mean, it's, it's late, but, you know, not too late. Um, and if we look at the data that we, that is available, you'd see that the northeastern part of the country, you know, that's where you have abject pro poverty. Um, there was one of the reports I was reading online and um, they said, um, People in northeastern, the average um, people, person in the northeast is spending 121 percent of their income on food, and I mean that tells me that maybe two out of ten days they don't they don't have food to eat because if you're spending 121 percent, that's already 21 percent more than normal. And what about the other parts of your life that require food? So uh, it's no surprise that that's where they've decided to um, start from. Having said that. Um, the, the, the stay at home and the lockdown, the social distancing, is a, is a very, very crucial part of fighting COVID-19. However, uh, what government has to factor in is that the loads of people that rely on daily living in Nigeria, and when you ask for a lockdown, it's just a matter of time that you're either going to start to have security issues like we were starting to have in some parts of Lagos, or you start to have a lot of unrest. Um, while government has really focused on fighting the COVID-19 infection and spread, I think they're not well prepared you know, to deliver these relief packages. And I think they should take it very, very seriously because you know, it's, just, it's just a matter of time. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And um, um, they should, while I, I mean, I would take that threat that they would go into the street. I'm even more um, um, scared of the fact that that might not be their first recourse to protest. The first recourse most likely will not be to protest. The first How recourse, would that be? The first recourse might be crime. Because oh. there's only a matter of, you know, you can only push people to a limit before they start, you know, taking advantage of whoever is okay. available to be taken advantage of. Okay, the idea of this conversation is to proffer a whole lot more solutions. We'll get to the issue of palliatives in a bit. Let's look at the, the way the data is collected for these vulnerable people, according to the minister. As she says, they have meetings with community leaders who then identify these vulnerable people and they've been doing it since 2016. Um, but with the situation that we have now, how confident are you and with our, you know, our penchant to um, <laughs> uh, sabotage things that come our way, how confident are you that these figures released are accurate and the money is actually getting to the people who truly need it. First of all, absolutely no confidence. 
there is no confidence in that press process um i would just say that that's the only option that they have for now that they think they have i think there are better ways to do it what are these ways um i think that you know um there are ways to, there there are ways to use technology to start to find people who are in that abject poverty you know brackets those who are in that basket i think that there's a lot of bias that can come from using community leaders um it doesn't mean that they are completely um, um, um irrelevant in the scheme of things but you can't come you can't rely only on the um, the data and the information they've provided to be able to give this relief fund. The second question is, I think that this is a great opportunity for federal government and the government of Nigeria to increase financial inclusion. Even if it's the mobile money, even if it's the wallet, there has to be a system to ensure that that money is getting to those people who really, 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 really need it. Oh, well, th know. There's this conversation about BVN. Does, it, uh, the, the, does the poor man that is looking for how to have a meal, have a bank account, not to talk of <laughs> BVN, is that a consideration it's, that could help? It's almost, I'm sorry to say, it's almost irrelevant when you're looking at the numbers that the federal government have put forward. Because um, if you look at the last um, report, I can't remember the body that released the report, the people in the poverty bracket are uh, about I think 86 million so if you said you've identified 2.6 million people you've not even scratched the surface now so the BVN conversation then does how many I think we have less than 50 million BVN numbers in Nigeria you know that's just 25 percent of our whole population right so the BVN is not this I would even say that mobile numbers might even be a better way to track because you can easily pull the numbers of those you know who almost you know the phone line is on is active but they've not recharged in a while and then you can do a lot of data mining to start to profile those type of people to see that okay this person has a phone number but doesn't have a bvn okay you know you can build a funnel to start to see people that are say, okay there are some people who have who can who are able to afford phones but they are like really, really poor. And then you can now even use well, those you, you know, to you, you have to have in mind that we're working on a very limited um, uh, stretch of time. Just hold on to that thought. I'm told we have um, via Skype joining us now, uh, Hamza Lawal. He is CEO of Follow the Money, and he has been following the money um, disbursed, being disbursed by the federal government. Thank you very much for joining us, Hamza. Well, thank you for having me. Good evening. Good evening to you. Uh, can you bring us, what's the latest with the disbursement of monies to the poor? Well, that's an interesting question. So for us that follow the money, what well, we've done after we've um, publicly heard about all this contribution, both by the federal government, private individuals and, and institution, is to start mapping all this money. So we created a platform, a uh, technology-driven platform, because right now we're all at home. <laughs> we can go out. Uh, we're in social distance as well as washing our hands with uh, soap. So we, we launched a digital platform and we started mapping. And, and so far, we've mapped over 40 billion that has been contributed both uh, by government, uh, private institutions, and individuals. Uh, and, and now we're advocating for the Ministry of the Ministry of Finance because for us to effectively uh, track, uh, you need data from government. So what. Well, well, we know that the president has set up uh, the presidential tax force on COVID-19 by Boss Mustafa, who is the secretary to the government. We also know that Boss Mustafa has instructed the Minister of Finance to coordinate the financial aspect of these uh, resources. We know that Aliko Dangote is leading the private sector-driven uh, front, and they have an account with the central bank. And yesterday, Boss Mustafa confirmed that uh, the accountant general of the federation have created an account that this money would be um, housed. But so far, the Ministry of Finance have not aggregated this information. So the information we have and we put out here are publicly available information, which we have uh, highlighted and what we've documented. Uh, what we're also going to do after this uh, ban is lifted, after the two weeks sit at home, is to ensure we uh, enforce a social audit where we will now be able to ground truth, go on the field. But maybe I should give a, a uh, 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 let, let me streamline this conversation. So when NNPC came public and said they've mobilized $12 million from uh, their partners, uh, so we engaged them on social media because the NNPC, via their verified handle, and say, how is this fund going to be disbursed and utilized? Who are the beneficiaries? 
And they responded saying that uh, these institutions that have uh, donated would use their uh, procurement policies to disburse these funds and procure, rather, they're going to do procurement and hand them over uh, to government. And then we said, well, what you issued publicly was not what your responses are. So, for instance, in Abuja here, the FCT administration got $500 million from uh, an entity. I don't want to mention names. And we engaged them again on Twitter, saying, what would you use this $500 million naira for? And they responded, saying $200 million would go to NCDC. And they were mute on the $300 million. We're aware that the president also gave a directive to release $5 billion to NCDC uh, to strengthen their capacity and provide the resources that is needed. So for now, we're still expecting and hoping that the Ministry of Finance would aggregate this information and publish it public so that the general public can follow the money. Thousand active young people will be able to effectively engage and track and provide feedback. Mind you, if the Ministry of Finance do not provide this information, then they lack that transparency. Because if you go to the website of the government of uh, US or the government of the UK, you will see all this information aggregated on their websites. You know, they're machine readable, and you can engage and give feedback. And, and Nigeria should not, you know, be, be exempted. Mind you also, we have procurement laws and procurement policies. In as much as this is a crisis, of course, this is a health crisis, this is a humanitarian crisis, an economic crisis, but we have these laws and we abide by this law. So they must ensure that the open government partnership, the open contracting process and standard must be adhered to. Nigeria is a signatory to the open contracting uh, uh, platform. So Let, so let, let, me, let me interject and quickly say, I, I get your point. We're always trying to look at what other countries are doing. This is an unfamiliar territory for everyone. But let's, from what you've been able to search in the time, in this very short period of time, are these monies getting to the designated um, uh, recipient, in your opinion, particularly uh, those vulnerable in the society? You know, uh, it's too early to say. Though we got feedback from our Follow the Money uh, lead, who is in the Kuali Area Council, where they flagged off this giving of poor people money. But if you look at it also, what it has done is, uh, is, is to show that the face of poverty are women, which is distasteful and it's not true. It also shows that poverty is sexist, which is totally wrong, because if you look at, you know, the reports and the pictures, even that the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs put out there. But then again, the data our government is using is questionable. Of course, Nigeria is the poverty capital of the world. So what this means is over 80 million people cannot afford 360 naira daily. But with this shutdown of the economy, it means that we would be over 100 million people that would go to bed hungry. Yes, the government has said that uh, our reserve, our grain reserve, 60,000 uh, metric tons will be released, and 6,000 will be the first phase where uh, Butcher, Lagos, and Ogun will benefit from it. But then when, when you look at it critically, uh, it's not properly coordinated. Even this data that the government is using, they say uh, two point, over 2 million households, 11 million beneficiaries as directly. This data, you know, uh, collected by NASCO. Why we, it, and don't call it conditional cash transfer. This is conditional cash payment. This go against the federal government monetary policy, cashless policy, and this, you know, does not even foster inclusion. In East Africa, for instance, in Nairobi, Kenya, they use M-Pesa. In every household in Nigeria, there's a mobile phone. So why can't we have a mobile transfer? Because for you to provide a social audit and ensure transparency and accountability, you must be able to follow the money, you know, from CBN or the Ministry of Finance, you know, to these people. But then if you give them cash, how are you going to track this cash? And if someone embezzled this money or some of this money, uh, you know, get missing, how would you be able to effectively account right. for them? I'll so this is not an effective way of supporting the vulnerable and the poor in the society. All right, uh, Hamza, you, please stay on the line. Um, let's come back to Tubosu. I, I don't know if you have a quick reaction before I ask you the next question. Uh, um, um, I, I think um, what Hamza is saying is in line with what I just said yes, about this. Indeed. There's a phone in that household. There's a phone very close to that household. Let's start with that and let's try to use that to penetrate and to have enough financial inclusion, you know, uh, for, for, the, for the people who are very poor because we have to not only fix the immediate problem of COVID-19, but we have to set ourselves on the Path to recovery of you know reducing the number of um, uh, of people in that poverty um, bracket. Okay. What, what we try to do um, in this conversation often is connect 
um, every issue around this. And one of them, and one of the concerns being circulated in social media, uh, there was a film, um, a popular actress went on a crying spree about the situation uh, with electricity. And we also know there is a video of a heated argument between residents and officials of the um, Lagos State Enforcement Team. Let me just put it that way. Um, there was a report also um, in the Gando area. I think I shared uh, that link with you earlier today to, to get your reaction to the way these palliatives are being disbursed. In that particular video in the Gando area and some other areas, you could see that the social distancing rule was not even uh, maintained. In, instead of like, like now pointing our fingers, you, you both have suggested some you know, ways that we can go about ensuring that there is accountability. But in the disbursement of these palliatives, let's talk about the food items and all of that, would there be a better way than what we see, we've seen so far? Of course, there will be. There is a better way, you know, of, of executing, you know, um, the food um, disbursement. And I think that it also goes back to decentralizing it. You see, when you ask people to come to a place, you know, you are not supposed to even have a gathering of more than 50 people. So when you have a point, a food point or a location where you uh, build the capacity for a thousand, two thousand, three thousand people to come and get food there, then you've already, you know, you're on the path, you've created a you know, an, an environment for a problem. You've violated the social distancing um, rules that you set for yourself. And I think that there are one of the ways that I would suggest that we go about this is, you know, um, by you know, distributing the food item in clusters, which is what I thought that the Lagos state government was going to do before, because there was a video that I saw online earlier in the week or uh, last weekend where someone was complaining about the size of food that was given to a number of community. And that person was saying, oh, I'm the um, chairman of, you know, a, an estate committee or something, and this is what they've given to us. You know, while that quantity is small, I think that that process is commendable, but they need to follow it through so that you are not asking a lot of people to come to a particular location to give them a lot of food, but, you know, you've decentralized it so much that you're either having, you know, one person and in 20, 20, 20, and then you can now, you know, push it. Um, 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 through them, and I think that it has a lot of importance. But just to quickly touch on the issue of electricity, that yes, you first indeed, there's, there's been a lot of talk about you keep people at home, and uh, there is no light. How are they going to the first, manage? The first thing I actually want to say is that, in as much as we've gone, government has gone ahead, and you know, there's been a lot of support, you know, about how we've become more educated. There's a lot, there's more work to be done, but it's commendable how far we've been able to teach. I say everybody's washing their hands now, you know, so there's, that, that communication has been effective. I think government needs to go a step further to start to assure people, you know, of what they are trying to do and let people realize that we're in this together. Now, it takes me to, to uh, specifically to the issue of electricity. We have a systemic problem in that electricity space. Um, I was speaking to a client um, uh, yesterday, and I said the problem in the electricity sector is like an onion. So you peel one, you see another, another layer. One. It's like, it's a multi-layer, you know, of problems. So um, I wasn't expecting much difference. There was a meeting, just before I get back to Hamza, there was a meeting, um, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, after that video went viral, came out to have a meeting with, uh, um, I think, with the National Electricity Regulatory Commission and the Minister of Power, and they talked about how they can find solutions beyond this period of incarceration. They're also saying uh, that they are going to look at how, in the, in the short term, they can alleviate the concerns of Nigeria. Do you see much coming out of that? They're supposed to, they're supposed to have another meeting, by the way. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I don't see much coming out of that. And the reason, the only um, um, silver lining that I see is the fact that perhaps because the industries um, they're shut down at the moment, they're not working, then we can have maybe a little more power to distribute to people. But see, if you have a keg or a bucket that can take 10 liters, come rain or sunshine, <laughs> you can't put more than 10 liters of, you know, 
content in that because we already have a capacity issue in our power sector covid will not take away the problem that is already in that sector i think what we need to, we just need to wake up to the reality of the fact that we have a problem in that sector so for example the reason there was going to be an increase in tariff in april is because government is actually subsidizing power as it were today so they've tried to you know they've put in place a policy to put a graduated um, um and spaced out increase to say every year we increase it so that there's no shock of just dropping that ball on everybody. So we have COVID-19 crisis now, and government says, okay, you know what? This is like a first major. We're going to we're not going to implement, implement that increase. Yeah. Let's just stay where we are now. Let's come out of this problem, and, and then, then we can, we can, we can because that. that. But it doesn't take away the fact that there's a liquidity issue, there's a transmission issue, there's capacity issue. At a point, the 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 we will have to address that. But we have an emergency now. They need to that, treat it as I, such. I'm sorry, yeah. but I'm just trying to be blunt and saying that the reality of of our situation today is that there's a pro, there's a systemic problem in our electricity sector Already. and COVID is uh, not maybe going to give us the, 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 the other side of this would be that we've learned that we our solution resides in us because before now we hear of uh, the person is sick they've gone abroad to get medical attention but we're all doing it here nobody's going offshore uh, let's get back to uh, Hamza quickly um, I'm told we have very limited time um, I want to talk to you about the accusations on social media there are videos everywhere of um, officials of government hoarding uh, supplies that are meant uh, for vulnerable people in, in the society. There's an unconfirmed video in circulation uh, that says, that shows, apparently shows an official taking some of this food from the boot of his car into uh, his home. Does this indicate probably a lack of adequate monitoring on the one hand? And Sarah, um, on, on a larger scale, did warn that we need to ha go be have a better system of monitoring and accountability, even though we are in a crisis. Oh well, yeah, the fact that we're in a crisis does not mean that we will throw away the pillars of democracy and transparency and accountability is a very strong pillar of democracy. Um, I'm really careful this period to comment on uh, some posts on social media because we know that as much as we're also tackling issues around COVID-19, we're also dealing with fake news and fake news has really entrenched our society. And I always say government is the fuel of fake news because when you don't coordinate effectively, when you don't provide uh, uh, timely information effectively, then uh, peddlers of fake news would then, uh, you know, create, uh, uh, you know, create disunity in the society. So I believe there's an opportunity here. And you see, Nigeria, we've not learned. This is not the first crisis uh, we're experiencing. And mind you, yes, we know that we've had a uh, crisis before, but not as this magnitude. But Ebola crisis came and we tackled it very well. You know, the flood crisis came, we tackled it well. And you know, put in better system in place. This, it's not rocket science, you know. Providing timely information, coordinating effort between government, civil society, to the private sector, is not rocket science. We cannot abdicate the role of government to private individual or the private sector. Government must always rise to the education, take responsibility, and inform citizens. Because if you don't provide information, then how would you garner support from citizens? Yes, indeed. Because you, up. Yeah, um, so, so for me, what's important for government now is to rise to this occasion, ensure that they uphold transparency and accountability standard. And we're going to keep following the money, but provide a social audit and inform the Nigerian people. Because we have elected our government and entrusted them with our mandate. And now is the time to show that trust. Thank you very much, Hamza, for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. Okay, I had to let him go quickly so I can ask you this quick one. Residents threatening to go on a protest. Is that a wise move at this time, especially with this lockdown, trying to save us from further spreading the coronavirus? What advice would you have for residents who are so aggrieved they want to take to the streets? Um, the, the advice I would have is that everybody should stay calm and believe that we are in a very strange time and this is not peculiar to Nigeria. Uh, everybody is coming to the term, you know, um, to the reality of this present situation. Um, I also want to um, urge 
um, the government of Lagos State to uh, quickly move to um, um, to calm the nerves of you know aggrieved members of the society who, uh, as we already know, some of them have lost they've lost their livelihood because the the city is in shutdown, um, and they should make moves to start you know a pragmatic approach to immediately start to cushion the effect of the pain of every of this lockdown on them so that they can bring back trust. I think that so far there's been a level of trust in handling, you know, COVID nineteen. So let's transfer, you know, that trust that we've that we have in the government and handling COVID nineteen to also, you know, delivering palliative and relief materials to the Divers, people. It's always a pleasure to have a conversation with you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much for, for coming on the program. Thank you. All right, we will take a short break now and when we return. Missed messages from Aquiabum State should NCDC inform states before announcing new cases of COVID-19? That's our question after this break.